Julie McCrossan, and it's my pleasure to be providing the introduction to this DVD. You'll be hearing firsthand from people who've experienced a significant change in their lives. This change has been brought about by one of Australia's most important social policy initiatives, the closing of large and often isolated institutions to help end the physical segregation from our community of people with disabilities. In the 1970s and 80s, people with disabilities and their families sought a greater choice in the range of accommodation and support available to them. There was a demand for options that would enable people to have their individual choices respected and to live in ordinary houses within the community and close to facilities, such as shops and transport. This process is known as devolution. Of course, moving into the community doesn't automatically make you part of it. We all have responsibility for enabling meaningful participation. Unfortunately, for many reasons, and despite legislation which upholds the rights of people with a disability to live in the community, thousands of people still remain in large residential institutions throughout Australia. Moving from a large care facility to the community can be an overwhelming experience. This can bring with it fears as well as great hopes and expectations. We're about to meet some former residents and their families neighbours and staff who are able to look back on their journey and share the benefit of their experience. We hope this DVD is helpful as you consider devolution, its challenges and its critical role in enabling a person to live a full life in their community. Now I have a son Mark who's 47 years old and he's been at Rydalmere for 25 years plus. I must say that I've never done anything so hard in my life before as placing him there. My daughter Sharon has been in Marsden for 32 years. She went in as a 10 year old. She's now 42 and she's still there. I always had in my mind that I could never do it again. That was something, it was almost a thing that broke me. It was a, a big deal to visit it for the first three years because I used to come home and cry my eyes out. She was very difficult in those days and she didn't want to be there. I still don't like it, still don't like it, but I don't have any choice. He has a reasonably good life there. I don't think the, the institution is ideal, far from it, but some of the group homes are small institutions anyway. They are so vulnerable and they have no way of telling you what's happening. So you really have to work out the best that you can for their life. I know there are wonderful group homes out there, uh, well run, and I know there are some terrible places that I wouldn't allow him to go to. But the big fear is, how do you know which one you're getting into? Some of them have gone out into group homes, but Sharon has high support needs, so she'll be one of the last ones to go. Um, and it's going to be very difficult to um, handle it. I also don't want him to be living without having his activity and his recreation and uh, all parts of his life being taken care of, which isn't ideal at Rydalmere, but he does have a lot of activity and he does have a lot of outings. They get used to the same people and when there's continual changes, they get very agitated, they get very... Um, they get very put off um, and they've got to have people that they trust and they know because that's all they've got. Um, and at Marsden in uh, Jessamine now they have a core group of staff which are excellent. Um, so I'm hoping and praying that when they go, go out into the community that, that that staff will go with them, that know them, they know what, what they like and dislike. I'm really concerned about staffing because um, not all staff have any training or very little. She's a severe epileptic and at the moment she's right beside Westmead Hospital and she's been rushed there a number of times with status fitting and in a coma. You can tell when she's going to have an epileptic fit but you need someone who knows her to know the signs. It's just the overall picture that she needs round the clock care and someone who knows what she needs. If it's done well 
people will be matched so that you're living with compatible um, people are compatible with one another but that doesn't happen either um, in, a, in a huge number of group homes so therefore they're really living in circumstances where they can't get away to get out to get away from it and that's something at Rydalmere Mark can go if if somebody's acting out he can just go and he can go for a long walk or he can go and talk to other people or um, a group home is not the same and obviously professionals are doing this and they know the the way to go but I can't see how you can just wipe parents off and not give them just even that the dignity of having a say the, this child that they have worried and cared about is then uh, you're almost being told you don't know and it, th these things worry me um, because I want to be heard I don't want to be <laughs> put in a position where I'm not going to have a say staff safety um, the peer group that you'll be with compatibility um, how far away it will be, how close to hospitals it will be, what area it will be, what are the neighbours like. And these are all just fears and they may sound irrational but they're not if you're a mother. I just can't, I just can't let him go and live somewhere that isn't a caring home. It could work if it's done properly but my fear is that it won't be done properly. Ultimately, a good group home is the way to go. But that is my big concern, is the, is the good group home. And if I could find one and find people who um, would have it set up well, um, then I wouldn't hesitate. We heard that there was a disability service after the house had sold and they were doing some maintenance work and we could see that um, the, the driveway that they were cementing didn't look like just your standard driveway for a family. So I think we started to ask questions and um, we heard that there was a disability service moving in next door. So that's how it came about. We're approached by Vicky who is the coordinator or was the coordinator of um, the home and the staff and the four um, people that were going to be living there and they came and approached us and told us who was going to be living there and if we wanted to actually meet them so we said yeah look we'd be open to that. I think for us because the neighbours before they were pretty rowdy you know they were people that were very loud and aggressive and so for us it was like oh it can't get any worse you know like sort of <laughs> you know like so just let's see what's what's happening, you know. Yeah, we, we were invited around to a, a barbecue when they first moved in, a welcoming barbecue. And um, we've got two children, they're now six and nine, and two girls, and they were quite nervous and scared of some of the noises that some of them were making in the way that they would communicate. And, um, and I think that was pretty normal that they would feel that. Because there was particularly one resident, she is very, very vocal. And because of her moving in there, and she probably needed to settle in there as well, you know. Like if you see now, after four years, we hardly ever hear her. Mm. But in the beginning, she was like incredibly vocal, you know. Like so she was screaming loud, like, Wah! you know. Like, mm. And our kids were like, every time she did it, it was like, oh, what's happening, you know? Like, and even for us, it was a bit like, ooh, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you don't know what's mm. happening. So. But then we communicated with them and they explained it to us and they moved it to another room. So That's incredibly, right. incredibly yeah. accommodating they were. They did explain to us that she'd come from an institution and, and it would take her time to settle. That was her way of communicating. She was anxious as well. And um, yeah, her, her screaming was, you know, an adjustment for all of us, but by them just explaining that that's her way of settling in. Um, and then when we said, you know, it was a bit loud at times and they did move her room, um, 
that it yeah just became less of a problem. And even our children, they've been going over there sometimes, selling lemons to the staff. Yeah. And, you know, like, so <laughs> right. they, you know, like it's an adjustment period for everybody, I think. Most of these people are just normal people. They go about their day, they go to school in the morning, they come back, you know, like so. There's a bit more car movement in, with a normal family, of course, you know, like because they all need to be moved in, in vans and buses. But If you've got any concerns, just bring it up and talk about it. I think um, th that helped us at the beginning and um, we felt very welcomed. And, you know, there were a few issues with lighting down the driveway. They had lights down the driveway and they had them on all night and, and we just um, thought that was a little bit too, too much and wanted to say, look, is there an option of not having the lights on all night, like it was a bit bright, with being next door to them? And they were able to change that. So my advice would be, yeah talk and communicate and I'm sure things can be sorted out. After four years I can just sound like they're fantastic neighbours. So. We got a letter from council to say there was going to be changes in the house next door and also the people that sold told us what that, who they'd sold to. So we thought this will be interesting and then they had ooh, roughly six months of gutting the house and a whole heap of workers in there and they were lovely, they were really nice and uh, the people just said, are you happy with this, are you happy with that, is this okay, are you coping well, uh, we're going to change the fence, you don't have to pay for it, we're just going to do it, it's a security measure, so we just sit fine. <laughs> Personally, I think they're one of the best lots of neighbours you could ever have. Yeah. Why is that? Well, you hardly see them, hardly hear them. We've actually had much, much, much noisier neighbours than what we have now. The one who bought the house. Yeah, one who sold it. We went and introduced ourselves to the workers and the um, residents. Occupants. Yeah, and it was lovely. It was really good. We've got Cameron, who loves to be out during the summer the outside, and he sings oh, all sorts of tunes. And when I'm doing the trees like pruning and that sort of thing uh, he's over there singing songs like say the sky boat song and things like that and i whistle back to him and i've been teaching him tunes with my whistles and he la la's along <laughs> yeah there's never really been any problems that i can think of because um vicky rang us first off and she said if you've got any problems please address them to us we're only too happy to um see what we can do about it and I've, I don't think I've ever had to do that. We went there once, you know, to... You to know, meet. Yeah. To meet, but with the parents were there too or somebody, you know, like the people's... The, you know, the, the kids. Kids' parents and things, yeah. you know, so we relatives. Their relatives, so to sort of a do. Yeah, barbecue, that's yeah. right, yeah. And once our other neighbours came to terms with what was happening, because I don't think they had been informed as clearly as we had been informed, and... Uh, once they had sort of worked it out and been able to see them and speak to the, the carers and the residents, then uh, they were fine too. So no one's, no one's actually said anything to us or how can you live next door to that or is it a problem? No one said that because it's not. We don't we never even mention it. It's, it's nothing like it's, to me it doesn't matter. I actually I like them better than some of the other neighbors. Most. Yeah. Most of the neighbors are really re less hassle, less anything. As soon as you get to know the people are going to be in there, go over, have a chat, meet the, the residents, meet the staff, and there's not any problems. How's Rachel? She's, she's settled? Or? She's settled, yes. Yeah. Okay. Very happy. Rachel's 22 now, she'll be 23 next month, and she went into grey stains when she was five and a half years of age. By the time we knew that devolution was going to take place, the Act had been passed and the fact that it had bipartisan support, we had no option other than to accept what had been you know, thrust upon us. And we're happy with you know, um, her treatment up there and, and, and the environment and the level of care she was getting. And then any time major changes like that set upon you, you, you know, it's, a, it's just a matter of, you know, you're uncertain as to what the next level of care will be. Once you accept the fact that 
you can't continue to fight it and then you have to take all your energies into making the changes the best that they can possibly be for, well, in our case, our daughter, then I, I think the process changes and you become hopeful about the future rather than fearful. I mean, you still have all those concerns in the back of your mind, but then it becomes a process of how the best way of dealing with those concerns. What can I practically do to make sure that my worst fears don't eventuate? So I was part of the panel that interviewed people for the original staffing and so I guess that allowed me, well it helped to allay fears because you knew that they were professionals that were applying for the positions. You know, they, they quickly learnt each individual needs for all the children and they've been tremendous. And then I think, we, you know, when the staff do rotate over, you know, the, the new staff are brought on board a couple of weeks prior to them commencing full time and introduced to all the children and go through all their medical needs. Um, so when they do come on board, um, if they're up to date with each individual child, uh, you know, with their medical conditions, so it's, it's been good. It's worked out better than expected, I think. Rachel's actually a completely different child. She's a much more relaxed child. She's a far happier child than she was up at Greystains. You are, aren't you? Enjoying those cuddles? There seems to be more relaxed atmosphere here, even though they're a high care house. Before we came here, we were fearful of what it sort of could become isolating and that they would be alone. But it's really become more a home for them. And there just seems to be more one-on-one -on -one communication between, you know, the clients like Rachel and the staff. And it, it just seems to be a more homely atmosphere. You know, they sort of explained to us before we come down here that, you know, they try to integrate them more into the society, you know, that has been true, you know, Rachel gets, you know, taken up to the, the shopping centre quite often, um, goes on numerous trips to the, to the river, to the parks, the different um, shows, um, circuses, um, different concerts, um, you know, and that occasionally happened up at um, Grey Sands, but down here, you know, they seem to have more I think, funding for the staff to allow those participations you know, with the community and, you know, and go on many more outings than she ever did up at, up at Greystone. Oh, there we are. Here we go. And the other thing is too, like, they've got um, multiple transport vehicles here for the parents to, to use to take their, their children out. So and that, that's been fantastic too, to take her out, because you know, she does have to go out with those special vans and they're always on call for the parents to use. And her bedroom here is well, designed for her needs and I know at different times they've got the fairy lights on the ceiling and that's because she just doesn't sleep at night so it's one of those stimulation tools that they had just for something for her whereas I suppose if she's in a room sharing with her number of children like she did up at Greystains I guess she'd be sort of distracting and disturbing far too many kids mm. you know to be able to to have that. Just checking your base uh, Rachel. We see ourselves as being in partnership, really, with all of the staff that are here because we're all in the same mindset with Rachel and I'm sure the other clients as well, which is what can we do to make Rachel's health as well as it can be? What can we do to make sure that her day-to-day -day existence is uh, as comfortable as what it can be? But the staff do know all the kids very well and then they make their day as enjoyable as possible by, um, you know, so knowing all the ins and outs and their quirks and everything and the different music they like and, and you know, where they like to go. And Rachel's personality changed when she came here after the devolution in the sense that she was a much happier and more relaxed child. We like to see them all happy and laughing, um, which makes us happy as well, seeing that the kids are enjoying themselves and not just sitting around you know, um, you know, doing nothing all day. There's always, always something going on with them uh, to make their life enjoyable as possible. Hello. Aaron was at Greystones for 15 years before the move to here. Yes, he is. Come on, let's go and see him. I made a decision when Aaron was seven to put him into grey stains. That would singularly be the hardest decision I have ever made in my entire life. 
once you do place your child somewhere and it works, why would you want to change it? You wouldn't. I didn't, you know, like, and even though I was sort of on the committee pushing for, for group homes, but still, at the end of the day, I was very comfortable with Aaron being where he was. I knew the staff, they knew me. Greystains was actually quite a good place to be. There was uh, registered nurses on duty 24-7. He had um, physiotherapy, speech therapy, um, you know, the, all the resources were there. There was a, um, you know, spa pool. So it was quite a nice place and I felt quite comfortable and I felt that Aaron was getting really good care. The group and the organisation decided that it would be in the best interest of our children to be in the community and to live in a smaller community setting as a group home. Um, at the time, my fears were why fix something that's not broken? because Greystains did seem to work quite well at the time. And I think most people whose children were at Greystains at that time felt the same way. Um, there was quite a bit of fear around staff. Uh, being in a big organisation, I guess people felt that there was an element of safety for their children because there wasn't just one person in control of looking after you know, four people or, or three or four people. So quite a few people had um, concerns about sexual abuse, that their child might be uh, more vulnerable in that area because there would be a per one person in a, in a group home situation at night times. Um, people were concerned that the medical treatment that was available at Greystains wouldn't be available in a group home. Um, and of course, you know, they were worried about funding because the government had said, you know, that this funding was an ongoing thing. But people were concerned at that time that whilst the present government was all for it, if there was a change of government, would they be as generous and would there be funding, you know, cuts in funding? Um, so they, those were the, the, the main fears that I guess myself and all the other parents of Greystains had at that time. Going back to the fears that I mentioned, none of them were substantiated. There's been no evidence of, of any of those things that people were, were fearful of. Staff have ongoing training, you know, like when, when, when the staff was interviewed for here, for Aaron, for this home, I actually interviewed the staff that were going to be working here. So, you know, if you want to, and it t depends on the level that you want to get involved, you can have quite a lot of say. I picked out the furniture, the red lounge in the lounge room. I went shopping with, you know, one of the nurses and we picked out the furniture together. You know, so you, you've got a lot more say in, in your child's life. You have a lot more say just in everyday things that when he was at Grayson's, we didn't have those, those says and those rights because they have rules and guidelines. Well, you can't do this and you can't do that. But here it is like a family home. I think the best thing has been for him is that he's got more community access. He's in a, in a, in a home where, you know, he was one of 37 at Greystains. Now he's one of four. That in itself tells you that um, his care, you know, he, his communication with others is sort of greater than what it, what it was at Greystains. It's like people push for a smaller classroom you know, we all want our kids in a small classroom, you know. We don't want them in a class of 40 kids or 37 kids because they will learn better, they, they you know, function better, their futures are brighter, and it's the same here. You know, he, he, he can sit in his room, he can watch the cricket in privacy, you know, he can have his own time. They all can, they've all got their own rooms. The benefits are just that his life is now more like a 26-year-old person without a disability. So he's living a more normal life in a home, in a, in a suburb, in a street. Yeah, instead of being sort of in an institution, you know, behind closed doors. It's easier to take out, you know, three or four children, or adults, I should say, than trying to get 37 people out. You know, so they all take turns. They were like, you know, well, so-and-so went out last week, so it's so-and-so's turn to go out this week. Being in such a small group, you don't have to, to do that. You know, when the weather's 
okay, he, one of the carers might take him to a cricket game. He actually became a member of the Lura cricket team, even though he doesn't, doesn't play cricket, but he was their mascot for the year and he went to their cricket presentation and, you know, there's a photo of Aaron with the team, you know, like, and he just thought it was wonderful, you know, like, he, he was so excited about that, you know, and that the community has embraced him as well. That wouldn't have happened at Greystones, not because they didn't want that to happen. It's just that the system wouldn't allow that to happen. Would you like a drink? You do. You want your drink, okay then. I think Aaron feels a sense of independence. I think he he senses that he has more freedom, and I think he senses and knows that he can express himself, be it positively or negatively, without there being any repercussions. So he's become, you know, he's 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 allowing his personality to come out, like in in you know, making demands of, on people and also sort of um, saying, well, enough is enough, leave me alone. Whereas he wouldn't have had that. It, that wouldn't have been allowed to develop in, in a place where there were so many people. And so he's confident to express himself. They have access to call the registered nurse who will come down, have a look. You know, I know that the, the nurses do a, a visit sort of on a monthly basis so they come into the homes, they check everything. Most of the people who are carers here have first aid certificates. A lot of them have got um, their certificates in disability services so that, you know, um, and I, that was one of my concerns. That was definitely one of my concerns was that, you know, here we had this grey stains, you know, with medical people on board and moving from that to just having people with first aid certificates. But in the three or four years that Aaron's been in a group home, um, he's been hospitalised once. And, um, you know, he was taken to hospital uh, by one of the carers because she thought he'd aspirated uh, some of his food. She took him and it was in the middle of the night. We had to meet her up here at Katoomba Hospital, which we did. He had an X-ray, he hadn't aspirated anything, and he came home. So I couldn't have asked for you know, better care than that. And if you had been at Greystains, you know, there was one person or two people for 37 kids. You know, so that, you know, they might not have sort of picked that up and for a few or four hours later. So I think it's, um, in one way, it's safer in a group home in terms of medical, you know, providing that you have those backup services around the home. Everything is monitored and closely monitored so that if there was to be a loss of half a kilo, people would start questioning why. It's not perfect, but nothing ever is perfect, like in, in a situation like this, you know, because we're dealing with, you know, children with, or adults, I should say, with um, complex needs. And, um, you know, th th there's no way that I would say that th this situation is perfect. I personally have had just a few issues that I've had to deal with and one of them was around feeding and um, I was able luckily you know to get a to get a second opinion on this particular situation and actually come to a compromise with the staff and you know the sort of um, the powers that be if you like to compromise you know what is best for Aaron in terms of feeding. Aaron attends the post-school options program, which is run at the old Greystains building. So he goes there every day. He does things like music appreciation and cooking, and he has com computer access. Right. Do you want to do the um, switch games or the puzzle games? Hit your tray if you want the switch games. All right, that's what we'll do then. So. You know, they're trying to teach him switches and, you know, turning on and off the computer and trying to get a communication program up and running with him. But um, Aaron's basic interests are all related to fun and happiness. He has a pretty good life. You know, they, they go out, yeah, bowling, swimming. Yeah, does more than me, actually. <laughs> Everything in life where there's progress and change, there's an element of fear associated with that. I'll see you next week, okay?
people like Aaron can't bring anything into being for themselves, so it's people like their parents and carers that do that for them. So it might be difficult to do that, but you have to do it. To make the world for them a better place, you have to make those decisions, because if, if people didn't make those decisions, our children would still be locked behind closed doors and never see the light of day. Now that Rana has moved into this group home, or her earlier days, uh, she was a bit uh, unsettled and uh, she didn't look disturbed, but she was almost looking around for all the others to also come along as well. But then in time, uh, that sort of settled down. And we always kept now calling this place Rana's home, Rana's home. We go and visit Rana at, at, her, at her home, whereas before we'll go to Greystains and visit Rana at Greystains. We were a lot younger when Rana was at Greystains. It was a bit intimidating, sort of going in there, and there were a lot of them there, um, a lot of people there who had disabilities, and, and it wasn't as welcoming in comparison, but I mean, it got better as we got older, uh, I guess, but then Rana ended up moving here and it was actually um, it just felt a lot more comfortable because we knew some of the uh, kids that came with Rana, so we did see them at Greystains, but everybody seemed a lot happier here, which is nice. I can't say I hated going there, but it wasn't a very good experience. You'd go there, you'd want to see your daughter, you, you, you missed her, mm. but leaving there mm. used to be a major, major, so because you used to feel for all the parents. Um, Sad. However, again, though, insofar as the, the staff, They've always been very caring, and when we went there also, at, at any given time, they made us well, well welcome at, at all times, as they do here. But see, I could not have imagined, for instance, a situation whereby we, we would just ring up here and talk to whoever is, is in charge here and say, OK, can we have Rana in the city on such and such date because we want to take her to a show? Mm -hmm. uh, we would not have, been, I, we would not have feel, felt that right somehow. Um, to ask for those sort of things at, in Greystain's environments because here you know that there is a vehicle available. Uh, my daughter's wedding is coming up and Elise and uh, Rana and another carer uh, will come and stay at a hotel near uh, where the church is uh, going to be. Um, and these are the, the sort of things I'm sure they would have tried to do somehow but I would not think that they would have been able to do this readily. It's a lot more comfortable coming here, it's quite easily accessible, it's a nice neighbourhood as well. It's nice uh, to be able to go outside and walk around and just feel really comfortable. Um, I feel like Rana's, I mean Rana's always a happy person, <laughs> she's always quite happy but she has seemed to come out of her shell a bit more here. <laughs> I just feel like the quality of life's a lot better. This is Rana's home, it's good and not institutional, it's just her home, you know, and I like, I have um, brought few people over and, and they love it and it's, it's good, it's, it's a good atmosphere, you know. I'm, I'm really happy um, that she's here. Yeah. It is definitely a lot more personalised, more than personal. it's, yeah, it's a lot more personalised mm -hmm. than what it used to be. Uh, she has always been very responsive to selective people. Mm and those selective people are lesser in number here, so she feels as if she's getting a lot more attention here than uh, she would in the other place. And for instance, uh, she had an issue with waiting for a turn to be fed, but all those you know, lesser people here, uh, so she gets her turn a lot, a lot quicker. And she's been, uh, generally speaking, a, a, a happier person. Much happier. And then she's got her own special people, like her. I like Elise, she loved Elise. <laughs> so it makes her happier mm -hmm. to be attended to by a lesser amount of people whom mm -hmm. she can relate to a lot easier than it would have been the case at uh, Grey States, you know, in an institutionalised environment. The whole thing is she gets attention, a lot of attention here, so and she loves that, she just loves attention. <laughs> so Ran, do you want to cook or do you want to paint your nails? both at the same time. Generally we've got a bit of a set routine. We do the nails first, 
and then we'll go out for a quick walk and then we'll come back and then we'll make a cake and then we'll go for another walk and then just sort of sit around, look at magazines. So I think Rana enjoys that. So we do, we like coming. <gasps> You're the lick. You're the lick. <laughs> She's getting ready already. She, she likes going out. We love going out together. But, uh, we do it very often. Or oh, I come here and, you know, cook. I cooked some Turkish food the other day <laughs> for her and not for her so much because she can't eat, but for everyone. That's good. We bring our partners here. So my sister brings her fiance, I bring my boyfriend here. I haven't had a chance to bring friends as such, but um, at birthday times they have really big parties. So a lot of Rana's friends get to come then, which is really nice to see. Everybody comes from the other homes um, that she hasn't seen in a while. And um, some people from uh, the school that she goes to during the day as well. I used to get worried a lot. You know, what's going to happen when she gets older? It was really a big thing. You know. But now, at least, I know she's got a home. Mm. So, it's great. When we heard about the devolution, I think everybody was devastated. Uh, staffing and um, parents, and I'm sure that the, the, the kids did as well. Because of the unknown, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't really know what devolution meant. We were just told that this was going to happen and everything was going to be okay. That's what we kept being told. Everything's going to be okay. And the staff were fine with the setting back in the institution. So we didn't, we couldn't understand why. And then the devolution happened. Um, the first group of clients moved out. That was, that was devastating. That was, yeah. um, we had staff crying. Um, we were probably two of them doing yeah. the same yeah. thing. But the homes, the group homes are amazing. Yeah. And the thoughts that I had, or we had, yeah. and I suppose everybody else had, isn't there anymore. I think everyone took a 360 degree turn because what it was and what it is now, it's just wonderful. The guys experience so much more and we've actually got the time to put into the guys one on one, which in the institution we couldn't do. The environment of the, the group home is exactly the same as it is in your own homes. We've got one resident who his vocabulary has come on great guns since we've been in the group home um, to the extent where he's asking questions like where are we going, what are we doing? Uh, they're not so much um, run by time. They have dinner, oh, well if it's ready at 5.30 they'll have it then or 7 o'clock. Um, it's just so relaxed. You know, we can give them um, an half an hour bath which they like and we've got the time to do all those sort of things and just give them feet massages and take them for walks. I remember we were told that we would be cooking and cleaning and there was a few staff that weren't real keen on that, um, but it's part of the job. Yeah, it's just like being at, in your own home. What I do at home, I do exactly the same at work because, yeah, it's just like your second family. And it's and also it's nice to be doing those extra things, cooking for them, and we're the ones taking them out on the outings. Um, we're the ones that are able to sit down and, and do the craft or take them for a drive or watch a movie with them. It doesn't matter what it is, giving yeah. them a massage. They get a lot more variety with community access, like we've got the time to take them to the zoo, um, to the aquarium, um, just for a picnic or even just for a drive when it's winter. And they just see so much more, they have so much variety in their life. Their safety is number one. I think their health is monitored. Uh, everything's monitored a lot more closely and a lot more professionally than it ever and was. And individually, yeah, than it ever was. <gasps> Who's that? Who's that? Hello. Hello, Ron. Families tend to come and visit a lot more. They're encouraged to. We'll have a barbecue for their birthdays. Um, Christmas, we have lunch. And a lot of the parents, I've spoken to some throughout the years, and they said that it's not so daunting coming up here to see their child and there's, you know, only three others against coming up and seeing 30 others. So, yeah, they, they tend to come up a lot more and even parents who had very little contact is, have, are having a lot more contact because they feel, you know, at ease, they can come in whenever they want. We never had the area 
um, for privacy for families to come up because mm. it was so busy and we had so many children. Now they can come up and they got their daughter or son's bedroom or lounge room or dining room or whatever. Parents are encouraged and have done come up to cook. Then they bring some of their family up and, and make it like an extension of their home. <laughs> What I'd say to staff would be, don't worry. You will have your misgivings. You will be frightened, but it will all work out. I started working in Grey Stains in August 2001. That was one or two years before they started the process of uh, devolution. Let's see, Rachel. The staff was kind of reluctant to uh, move from a very protective, um, all working together in one place uh, situation to uh, being on their own in the group homes. But it's a, a great thing because the staff themselves have much more time for the clients. You know, the staff to client uh, ratio at Grey Saints was one staff member to six clients. Yeah. And now in the group homes, you have four clients, sometimes five, for, for uh, two staff members. So you can, you, you can see that they have more time to you know, take care of the small details, uh, dress them really properly, do some ex uh, exercises, uh, use the equipment, uh, go out with them, and, or even here in this situation, they even have a pool that they can use in the summer and put, take them to the pool. I remember uh, the situation in Grey Stains. Everyone had uh, during dinner time, for example, or, or breakfast. Everyone had big gowns on, and uh, they had uh, bibs on just to keep them clean because there wasn't enough time uh, and staff to when they spilled something to to change their clothing. But now in in in, in the group home, they they just have really nice bandanas as uh, bibs, and they don't use the gowns anymore because there's more, more time to, uh, when they do spill, to, to change the clothing. And now it's, it's more dignified uh, being in your own, own home, being, having your own room and dressed properly like you and I are, are dressed, going out in the community uh, looking good. In the group home, they uh, don't have to share as much as they had to do at, uh, at Grey Stains. At Grey Stains, you had a big group of people together you only had a few pieces of um, equipment and they had to share that equipment. And they had to share the standards or the walkers or uh, the massage equipment, the massage mattress. They had a spa bath at Grey Stain, so they could take turns uh, having a, a spa bath. But at the home, for four clients you have one spa bath, so they can regularly get a nice spa bath and the equipment they can use, uh, they can use it uh, more regularly. Uh, which, which helps with their health. When they were all living in Grey Stains, we didn't have all this equipment. There were only one or two for all the clients, so it had to be on the floor, which is not really um, dignified or hygienic because people are stepping over you. Um, and uh, it's really difficult working on the floor. You have to bend down. And uh, this is a much, much better solution for both the staff and, and, the, and the client. I work for Disability Enterprises. I've been there nearly 15 years. So I was there when it was Greystones Children's Home, when it was an institute. And I've seen the transition to community-based living. And I'm part of the healthcare team now. I'm an endorsed enrolled nurse. And so I've worked as a uh, personal care worker as well as a nurse. So I've seen every side of, of the service. Okay, let's do this. I'd worked elsewhere and I'd seen the devolution process, I'd seen the transition from an institute to group homes and I'd seen all the angst that the families and that um, the staff had gone through and now when I come along to Greystains Children's Home and lo and behold it, it's going through the same process, I could see that the outcome was going to be great, I could see everyone worried and, and anxious and heartbroken in some cases and I knew that it was going to be alright but I couldn't get that across to everybody because they had to go through it like I had before. Having a bedroom to yourself means that you can have more sleep, a better quality of sleep, and that impacts on the, on the well-being of the client. In, a, in an institution, you often have to share a bedroom with one or even multiple other people, 
our clients need turning, need changing, need um, disturbances in the night, which means that everyone gets disturbed. So something as simple as having your own bedroom um, and the dignity and the privacy, I mean, people feel that, the clients feel that too. So that all impacts on their, um, on their well-being and well-being impacts on health. When you have um, a mass of people, like an institute, cross-infection is um, can be rife. Um, one person gets the flu, then everyone gets the flu. But when there's less staff and less clients, there's less chance of cross-infection. There's less germs. Um, so, yep, things something like something like that can mean even less hospitalisations to a client. In a big institute, there's a lot of sharing of equipment. Of course, there has to be. In a group home setting, enteral feeding um, equipment can remain personalised, individualised, and it's easier to, to have personalised stuff. There's more time for staff to concentrate on the needs, the health needs and the care for the clients. And so more time means more care. More care means better care. Better care means better health. In a larger institute, you often go along in mass to the to the same doctor, um, or a doctor comes to the institute, or um, there isn't that choice for you as a, as a client. So in a group home, the parents um, have a choice of who their child goes to see. It might be their own GP that they and they have that choice. They can do that, and so the doctor then can um, follow through with families. When you have your own doctor, you can get a build up a better relationship with that doctor, and a better relationship means that the doctor can perhaps um, nip things in the bud earlier, um, faster diagnosis, which means um, you can prevent a serious um, outcome, which could mean preventing hospitalisation if you go that far. What's happening? I guess the most heartwarming thing that I ever heard a parent say was after their child had moved from an institute and they'd had to surrender their child to the institute then they had to surrender them again to a group home and, and relive that all over again. Um, after about three years they said to me now we can die. The parents were elderly and that had been on their mind. Um, you know what was going to become of their child. They said it because they could see that their daughter was well looked after and that their daughter would continue to be well looked after. She was in a, in a house with three other clients that were friends by this time and she saw the extended families from the other clients' families were looking out for, for, for their daughter as well and they just felt happy. The future looked rosy. We've spoken to many people about devolution. But what about talking to someone with a disability? You're about to meet a remarkable woman who spent 30 years in an institution before, in her own words, escaping to a small group home in Abbotsford, Sydney. She's lived there now for over 16 years. Jan Daisley's story is important, not only for the insight it provides about institutional care and her determined quest for a normal life in the community, but also for the positive voice it provides for the people who can't articulate their own experiences. Since acquiring multiple physical disabilities, including blindness, in an accident in 1960, Jan Daisley has studied at university and gained two degrees, a Bachelor and Master of Education. Jan is widely recognised as a leading advocate for people with disabilities. She's been elected to numerous boards and committees and was made a life member of People with Disability Australia in 2006. In 2008, she was a finalist in the category of Personal Achievement in the National Disability Awards. She was featured in both the 2007 and 2008 publications of Who's Who of Australian Women and also in the 2008 inaugural state edition of Who's Who in New South Wales. And in 2009, she was the ambassador or as she likes to say, cover girl, for the New South Wales companion card. As if that isn't enough to keep her busy, Jan has already written and published two books and with her scribe, Peter Kasser, she's currently working on her third. In the institution, 
seven, two, one, three, hard. Jen, is this something you could have done in, in an institution? Or? No, no, I, I was never, I mean, I have policy or any way to do it. I, 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 I do it, but I gave up. It was hard for me. It got me hard. You always give me the hands. I was right under there. Here, I can ask you. People go right in the head. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to be there. Can you tell me how you felt? When you, f when, when you first knew that you might be able to move out of uh, the institution and into a small group home? I was very uh, happy to think I could move out. And I think from what, we, what I've discussed with the, the carers and the parents, their main fear was that people living in institutions were safe and that if they moved into a house which had s smaller numbers of staff that they would not be unsafe. Yes, that's right. I never had any fear. Your parents weren't particularly happy, were they? No. My was very, very, and then to say we always, but I said, no way. It must be very hard for the residents who can't actually say, this is what I've always wanted. But that's how you felt, wasn't it? It is, yeah. It is. I would talk and, and say how I felt. And my parents, you always agree to, to say me, because I will always have my way. <laughs> I noticed in your book, you called the chapter which dealt with moving out was called The Great Escape. <laughs> yes. Can you tell me something about that? Well, I was... Uh, I don't know how I feel. I feel sad. The name of friends. But at the same time, I feel... I tried to, I got in the life of a friend of Stein. I never had a life for 30 years. And I thought now I have a chance of going with my friends. And I was determined to make it work. What is it about living in an institution that's so different to living in a small house? Well, in an institution, you have no right. You are told what to do, how to do it. We do it. You have no choice. You have to turn it on or send it. You're in trouble. But here, in the, in the house, I can have a look. I choose a food. I choose. Where I go, 
I go. I I have trace and before I had no trace and no freedom. Yes, I understand. Privacy, I think, is also. Yes, well, privacy is indecency. It's not indecency. Yeah, I agree with indecency. Every indecency, yeah, other people. Yeah. Uh, there was five people in my room. And that's very hard. And I have a room on my own now. It's heaven. Can we talk about staffing? Staff is a big issue. We try to have the same staff all the time so they know the people, they know what to do and, and the people that the staff. The other day is when the staff are new. And the first way, the learn and the work with the person. This is my home, and I work in my home. So this a part of the household, too. Can you tell me a little bit about how many people live here and how it actually functions as a house? There are two other people, two guys and myself. And I just feel, I just feel this. The two guys are more and I am every age the very life I do it. I think we don't do anything together. We have seven lives and we just share a house. I was like living under the Yeah, I'll be here if you want to talk. Is there anything you'd like to say about the advantages of, of being in a group home? Oh yeah. You do have a week. You have a week. For 30 years, as a I had more or less that life. Now, in the last 60 years, I have a life. I have done more in that time than I did in the whole time I was in the institution. And it's very rewarding to me. I feel satisfied with what I have achieved as a person with a disability. I have a neighbor in store. I have paper for road. I have friends in church. I just to live on this another person. In the, the suburb, I like to be the liar. And in the city, very, very nice. And the 
how many things before I knew how the education I was held on the back in a week. I was last week for and I have been I am very, very happy now. I had a chance to do now at the start of the life. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha